Remember dairy farmer Alan Smith, written off as dead by his doctors. His family insisted on intravenous vitamin C, and Alan survived. Well, after that story last month, there was a clamour throughout the country. Families of swine flu victims demanded the same treatment. As Melanie Reid reports, they want to know, why can't we try it? I'm not saying go out there and, and, and grab the vitamin C and everything's going to be OK, because we don't know that. I, I don't know that. We, we never got the chance. While 57-year-old Bob Goodwin was on life support battling swine flu, his son James was battling the hospital, trying to get intravenous vitamin C administered to his dad. I still believe that my father didn't die. Uh, there was something else happened. He, you know, he, never, he never died. He just didn't get given the chance to live. Like many New Zealanders, James Goodwin watched last month's 60 Minutes story, Living Proof. It was about King Country farmer Alan Smith, who back in 2009 was all but dead with swine flu. Auckland Hospital wanted to turn his life support off. The group is in unanimous agreement that Mr Smith should be removed from ECMO and be allowed to die. Continuing is only prolonging his inevitable death. My brother just stepped in and he said, no, you haven't tried everything. You've got to try vitamin C intravenously, high doses. The family had to fight the doctors. I says, what have you got to lose, mate? You give me one good reason what you guys have got to lose by trying it. But once the hospital agreed, Alan started coming right. And today, well, he says he's proof that it works. In a nutshell, I wouldn't have survived if I hadn't had the vitamin C. Well, he's the, the rock in our family. Um, Since that story, people like James Goodwin clung to the hope that high-dose vitamin C could save their loved ones. I feel robbed, robbed of at least having a chance at letting them have a fight. James' father, Bob, was in North Shore Hospital, critical on life support with swine flu complicated by an underlying autoimmune disease. You knew your dad was had no dying? Hope. Had no hope, yeah. They told you that? Yep, yep, they told us that. There and was... you wanted high-dose intravenous vitamin C? Yep, I did, and they didn't want to give it because, A, they didn't know enough about it, but then they still said it will be detrimental to his kidneys and cause kidney failure. By this stage, his kidneys had already failed and was on dialysis. Um, I had a number of a vitamin C specialist for them to contact. Uh, nobody bothered to ring them. This went on for days. One other one that gets me is they came, this is the, the night before Dad died, came to us to have a meeting with Mum and told us it was time to turn the machines off, let Dad go. So my argument was, so I have the power, I said I can pull the tube out of Dad He's nodding at me, pull the tube out of Dad and kill him. I have that right. He said, yes. I said, why don't I have the right to try and give him something else? Because you guys don't know about it. Meaning intravenous high-dose vitamin C. Meaning the vitamin C. They did finally give him the proper dosage, I think 6, 6 a.m. in the morning, the morning that he died, but it was all just too late. We just wanted the right to try it. Like, they've told us he's going to die. They can't do any more. Why can't we try? The same question was being asked by another family who had a loved one in Auckland's ICU. The 36-year-old had been in a coma and on the life-saving ECMO machine for nearly a month before he died last week. The family made repeated attempts, even involved lawyers, trying to get the hospital to administer high-dose vitamin C. But the hospital was adamant. Vitamin C has never been shown to have benefit in the treatment of any sort of influenza, including H1N1. There will be no circumstances in which will be given high-dose intravenous vitamin C. 
what I'm concerned about is that to come to a blanket judgment that they will never administer this treatment under any circumstances doesn't seem to me to be the exercise of a judgment. It seems to me to be the application of a rule, which can't be consistent with the Hippocratic Oath and all of those other um, ethical obligations and legal obligations that they have under the statute. The Public day, law expert so, May Chen has been advising and acting for families who have hit a brick wall with the hospitals. The reality is that high-dose intravenous vitamin C has been administered for the last 10 years by professionals and it's been found to be efficacious. I mean, the difficulty here, Melanie, is that we're not talking about ground-up gorsebush, we're not talking about leeches or being cut or witchcraft. I mean, we're actually talking about a treatment that has quite a long pedigree to it. With regard to high-dose intravenous vitamin C, there is no um, convincing evidence at all in this population that it, uh, uh, that it works. No convincing evidence at all. And there is David Geller has been a principal advisor to the Health Ministry and is a senior intensive care specialist. We as a group believe it's harmful. Um, we, in this setting of critical illness, the potential for harm outweighs any putative benefits. So uh, when we families say repeatedly, why could we not just have tried? Yeah. He was going to die. Yeah. What is your answer to that? I, I wouldn't be comfortable giving it to them because I think that would be a deceitful act. You know, we're not in the business of actually raising false hopes. You know, we're in the business of being real and being honest. The patients who've had vitamin C intravenously in uh, New Zealand will be laughing at those doctors and laughing at the medical profession and be absolutely disgusted with the health system as I am in here in Australia. In Melbourne, Professor Ian Brighthope specialises in nutritional and environmental medicine. He's used intravenous vitamin C for 30 years in private hospitals and clinics. People don't die of swine flu, they die of a chronic vitamin C deficiency. It is absolute neglect to, to, to not allow or prohibit the use of intravenous vitamin C for somebody with an acute viral illness like the swine flu in the early stages. I am absolutely horrified that it's continuing in hospitals. With regard to um, the, 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 the position being put forward by the vitamin C lobby, um, we use a term, a term called author bias. You know, they are not coming at it with equi equipoise. Are you? Yeah, absolutely. Look, if there was a treatment, that if, if vitamin C truly did fix these people who are so desperately ill, why wouldn't we give it? Our lives are dedicated to improving people's lives, improving their outcomes. You know, I mean, it's just madness to how think many, that we wouldn't. How many intravenous vitamin C infusions have you done? I've not given any. So how do you know it doesn't work? From a critical appraisal of the, of the literature. It doesn't work because they haven't tried it. It doesn't work because they've been told it doesn't work. And this is a major myth in the medical profession that needs to be debunked once and for all. People are dying because of the attitude of the medical profession. What we do know is there is an ongoing tension between mainstream and complementary medical doctors. But more and more, people with serious or terminal illnesses are exercising their choice, many turning towards complementary or alternative treatments. In New Zealand and here in Australia, there are a number of clinics which provide high-dose intravenous vitamin C treatment, but you'll find they don't advertise, choosing instead to keep a very low profile, and there's a reason for that. The fear is basically based on the history of the fact that uh, people have been investigated by the health authorities uh, when, in, in fact, they've become vocal in this area. Professor Avni Sali is the director of a Melbourne clinic that, amongst other things, researchers and administers vitamin C. So if you put your head up above the parapet, so to speak, you were at risk? Yes, you, you would be at risk, yes. But let's go back to the case of farmer Alan Smith. I am alive. I was supposed to be dead. They wanted to turn me off. How do and, orthodox um, medical practitioners explain his survival? I'm thrilled that Alan Smith got better. Absolutely thrilled, you know, absolutely thrilled. Uh, the link of causation with vitamin C, I mean, uh, there, is, it's, there is no proven causation. He got vitamin C, he got better.
He was also on uh, a range of uh, extraordinary treatments, um, uh, extracorporeal membrane oxygenation, uh, very careful lung ventilation, you know, 24 by 7 nursing care. I think you know, nobody disputes yeah. that he got incredible treatment at this yeah. hospital. The question is, all the clinicians in this hospital advise that his machine should be turned off. He then got high dose intravenous vitamin yeah. C and he improved. You know, there are other things that were going on with that man could, that could equally explain that, that course of events, the improvement is and the Is that deterioration. not all a bit convenient? Well, you know, that's life, you know, Melanie. You know, I mean, you can look at it through a very narrow prism and just say, oh, it was vitamin C. But actually, this, it's, it's too complicated to say that. I it's don't just, think it anyone's saying it was way. just vitamin C. Yeah. It certainly looks like the vitamin C is the thing that at the very end of the line was the difference between him living and dying. You can look right across the board at a range of complex interventions that happen to patients all across the country. And can you go back and say this one thing, that a bus drove past at that particular time and they got better? Was uh, it the bus? I you don't know? think we're talking uh, about that. We're talking about, as I say again, one of the most researched therapeutic substances in the world. Well, you know, is it? I don't think it is. <laughs> I absolutely dispute that. You know, when I start the professors to, I, in Australia that we've spoken yeah. to say that orthodox medical clinicians they need to read more. Well, you know, I think we all need to read more, Millie. No question about that. And I, like, I'm going to say it again. I don't think for a millisecond that we've got a monopoly on the truth here. But we have a framework to assess things, and it's critically important that we actually apply that framework. And it's not hit and hope. All the while, though, across the Tasman, another swine flu vitamin C case was unfolding. 20-year-old Laura Clark was in a coma on ECMO life support and in critical care. Yeah, the prognosis was pretty um, reasonably grim. Because, um, Matthew Clark is Laura's progress. older brother. What were your family told at that point? Oh, we're, we're told that, um, that Laura is a very, uh, she's very sick and... Um, yeah, it's basically, yeah, it wasn't looking, wasn't looking too good. From Australia, Laura's family saw our 60 Minutes story and set about tracking down Alan Smith in New Zealand. Alan! Hello. <laughs> I'm a pilot myself and uh, got the reg off his plane then uh, looked up on the New Zealand um, aircraft registry uh, and found his, basically his address was like a partial stalking. And then Matthew contacted Alan Smith, which eventually led him to vitamin C specialist Ian Brighthope. Matthew asked me if uh, uh, I thought uh, vitamin C would help with uh, Laura, and I said I believed it would, um, from my own experience of the use of vitamin C in serious and critical cases, and also from the uh, history of the successful case that you had in um, Auckland in New Zealand. Alan Smith's case? Yes. Here in Sydney, in a desperate attempt to save Laura, St Vincent's Hospital agreed to the family's wishes to administer high-dose intravenous vitamin C. Progressively, her, her lungs did, did seem to clear, um, and then, yeah, basically she was starting to, um, yeah, lungs have func started functioning in the way that they should, should do so. As in the Alan Smith case, Laura's lungs recovered to the point that she was taken off the life-supporting ECMO machine. We basically thought that was the jackpot. Um, yeah, we were really excited because of the news. Um, yeah, there was sort of just, yeah, we were, but we are also trying to be careful that it wasn't just a coincidence, but it did, yeah, it did sort of seem that the vitamin C was working. Laura's treatment was being determined by the hospital in consultation with the family. Despite Ian Brighthope warning against it, the hospital took Laura off the vitamin C. There was a few complications and um, yeah, and part of the agreement in the beginning was that um, if Laura had been any harm then, then we were to basically cease the treatment, being unconventional and yeah. Unfortunately, Laura passed away last Saturday. Yeah, While it is yet to be fully determined, it appears complications led to a severe infection. It's been, been a really hard sort of last four, four weeks ever since she's been admitted to the hospital. But yeah, um, 
we feel that we have exhausted all, all avenues. There is little question Laura's treatment and her death will add to the already controversial vitamin C debate. If the vitamin C lobby feels so strongly that it's the miracle cure that they say it is, let's test it. Okay? Who usually and see funds trials? Pharmaceutical companies. So is a pharmaceutical company going to fund a trial for vitamin C? Well, why don't the vitamin C lobby fund it? All these people in hospital need to do is a good study on influenza using 60 grams per day or more for the sick patients to see how quickly people get better. Do something positive instead of being so negative all of the time and repeating this blarney about lack of science. Have a look in the literature. It's full of good science to support the stuff.